seconds. Ooh. Four, three, two, one. Love Talk Radio. Okay, we're sitting up straight. We're very serious here at Love Talk Radio where we do the K factor, where K equals kindness and the factors are all the things that lead to it. I am your host. I'm here with my co-host. I'm Dr. Deb Carlin. This is, well, he's incognito, but he's really Dr. Richard Flint, but he likes to just go by Richard Flint or Richard Flint seminars or, or no apologies with Richard Flint and his co-host, Dr. Deb Carlin. <laughs> yeah, I also go by Hey You. <laughs> hey You! <laughs> that's, my, that's my Chinese name. Hey <laughs> You. You know what? That's kind of cute. I could see that as sort of like a dim sum dish. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to start my own uh, fortune cookie company. I think that would be great. Mm-hmm. And we could put all, we could tell everyone's fortune. I, it would be all good. Well, I, I'm not sure I'd want them all to be good. I might just throw in a few <laughs> whammos there just to surprise people and see how they reacted to it <laughs> yeah you, you threw me some sort of a zinger before we went on the air but you know i have to say i let it go i just let it go i don't even recollect exactly what it was but it was a good one so there so touche touche is that french touche oui monsieur <laughs> so our topic today you know richard and i have these on-air conversations and and do the show and then we we're friends and we're business associates and so we have private conversations but you know what i'll tell you something our conversations are always about the ways in which both of us are so concerned and compassionate and in love with life and the human condition and we both strive to really understand what is it about us as human beings what makes us tick? What slows us down? What gets in the way? What does this one particular word mean? And one of the things I love, 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 love about Richard is he always is focused on a word a month. And that is really delicious because if you spend time really thinking about a word, all kinds of things run through your mind and then you connect a lot of dots. So the question today is about trust. And what role does trust really play in our overall well-being? So what do you think, Richard? In the scheme of life, how important, on a scale of one to 10, one being not important, 10 being important, where would you put trust? I would put trust all the way at 10 plus. If I could go up to an 11, I would do that because trust is the foundation of everything. Everything, absolutely everything. You agree? Well, in my in my hierarchy of terminology, mm-hmm. um, I put trust in my top five. Yeah. Because I think that trust is so important to the foundation of decision that we make. I mean, because mm-hmm. trust is more than a word. It's a it's a mindset, uh, and it's a mindset that carries with it its own level of emotions. Oh, you know, you and I are so absolutely tethered to one another that as you're speaking, you're speaking my heart and my thoughts. Keep, keep talking. I love what you're saying. Well, it's just, you know, and it's a, it's a word uh, that today to me is, is at the center of so many unspoken conversations. Mm. Mm-hmm. Because I think trust is a difficult word for a lot of people to talk about. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'm not sure people know how to define it. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure that people really understand the depth of the power that that word has in the in a human life. Uh, because it's it's almost like it's a it's a silent part of life that's used to make to define life. Uh, and, and, and sometimes it's a hidden emotion that affects us. I mean, you ever had somebody tell you, you know, uh, I don't like that person. 
you know, and what they're really saying is not, I don't like that person. I don't trust that person. That's a really exquisite point to make. You know what? <clears throat> that's very, uh, that's very significant. While you were, while you were speaking there, what I did was I went over to my other computer over here and I entered into Google, our little buddy, the word trust, a firm belief in the character, strength, or truth of someone or something, a person or thing in which confidence is placed, confident hope. Do you think trust creates confidence or confidence creates trust? I don't think you can have confidence without trust. Can you have trust without confidence? I think that with the underlayment of trust, confidence becomes their partners. Well, trust is one of those words that to me travels with a family. Yes. And when, when you have trust, um, you have truth, your own definition of truth. I like that. Uh, and when you have trust, yes, you have confidence. Uh, and, and trust is a big part of belief. It's a big part of faith. So we have trust in the center and it's the family and there's confidence. There's belief, there's faith. Uh, and, and there's awareness because trust creates awareness it, it, that so much of what we trust in is because of what we're aware with. And that awareness um, is all about behavior. Mm. Um, because I think behavior either strengthens or weakens trust. That's interesting. Say more about that. Well, I, I think that, you know, when we look at people, we, you know, you know, my little, my little saying behavior never lies. It really and, doesn't ever. You're right. Yeah. And when we look at people, you know, we want to trust them so many times. Yeah. But uh, their behavior makes it tough. You know, and there's another <laughs> interesting factor here, uh, Deb. Yeah. That is... Uh, what part does uh, forgiveness play in trust? Uh, you know what? Let me tell you something. Now you hit a magic button with me. I have such an issue with that word and with that term. I was minding my own business this morning. Laying in bed, looking out the window, looking at the snow coming down, watching the waves on the lake. And I was all just comfortable. And then I decided, you know, to to actually do a little bit of work from bed, you know, just cause it's nice and snuggled in in there and I've got my phone. And so I'm doing checking emails and doing some social media, just perusing. And then I got up and did coffee and did a little bit of stretching. And then I decided to take a nice long hot bath and I get in the tub and all of a sudden I'm thinking of that word, forgiveness, forgiveness. And I thought, why do I have such an issue with forgiveness? And I start thinking, because there's a certain something about forgiveness that I always think it's God's position to forgive. And what is my position with forgiveness? I mean, do I forgive people who have been scoundrels to me? You know, I really, what I do is I seek to wrap my mind around the underlayment of what they did, what their behavior revealed about them and then i just you know i back away is what i do i don't i don't stay engaged with people that have completely violated and annihilated my trust and my confidence and my belief and my faith in them and so forgiveness to me doesn't enter into the formula and then i thought well what who invented this word anyway <laughs> i got agitated about it who who is responsible for this word is forgiveness. And then I thought, what do we do? Like, where do, where does forgiveness start and end? Do you forgive your, your spouse if they step out of the marriage and, and have a, you know, a rendezvous with someone else? Do you, 
do you forgive someone if they if they owe you money and they don't pay you? Uh, do you forgive someone if they if they smash into your car? Well, instead of really looking at the term forgiveness, I think in terms of you just try to you try to wrap your mind around what it was that happened and work your way through it. And you know when I when I pull up the word forgiveness on Google, they say the action or process of forgiving. <laughs> Okay, so you have to go back to forgive. And if you go to forgive, uh, stop feeling angry or resentful towards someone for an offense, flaw, or mistake. Okay, but is it really? I see, I don't believe that that's, <laughs> I don't believe that that's what they really mean. Because forgiveness, if you forgive someone, don't you then have to come back together? Because if you're not, if you're not um, if you're not angry with them, then why would you stay away from them? If you're not chided against them, then why would you stay away from them? I just I'm confused, evidently. It sounds like it. You're going in a, a real interesting circle <laughs> of what you're trying to explain to yourself without understanding what your question is. <laughs> Can you help me, Dr. Flint? Can you be Dr. Well, Flint today? I um, always take forgiveness back to uh, a biblical principle. I just pulled up uh, what is the biblical meaning of forgiveness. It says the Bible has plenty to say about forgiveness. Uh, it's got a wide range of meanings, including to remit a debt or to leave someone or something alone to allow an action, to leave, to send away, to desert or abandon, or even to divorce. Well, it, it's, it's interesting because every time in the New Testament, uh, I look at situations where Christ was in a uh, conversation with somebody and forgiveness was a part of it. Yeah. Uh, he always tied forgiveness to accountability. Oh that every time there was forgiveness, there was accountability to improve behavior. Okay. And it's one of the reasons that I believe that accountability, I mean, forgiveness is not something you grant to people. It's something they earn by the improvement in their behavior. I mean, if there's not a consequence or an accountability factor, I come to you and I go, uh, Deb, forgive me. You go, okay. So I got your forgiveness now. So what I do, I just walk out and do it all over again. And I come back and go, I screwed up again, man, forgive me. You go, okay. Oh. And there's no consequence. There's no accountability to it. This is why I think that forgiveness is not something you grant to someone. It's something they earn through the improvement or the non repetitiveness of that behavior. And I think sometimes we we treat forgiveness as a blanket and yeah, it's it's maybe, not do you think i've done that do you think that that's why i'm so confused about that topic i i think so because i i from what i know about you um you have a big heart that wants to accept everything that people says <laughs> and so and when when you tie that to trust yeah uh, that's a platform for disaster and for disappointment. Yeah, it is. Uh, because again, forgiveness is not something you grant somebody. It's something that you hold back until you see, uh, you know, the, the improvement in their behavior. You know what? That's a really good point because if you grow up, in a position of trust. You know, it's like Jean Piaget, the psychologist from whence not so long ago. Um, lifespan theorist. So for every stage of life, he's got a stage that you go through and the opening one is trust versus mistrust. And the last one is integrity versus despair. So as an infant, you come into the world and you either have your needs met, 
in in every way imaginable your physical your psychological your your you know everything from being fed and cuddled and played with and held and and kept safe and fed and all that to mistrust and we're you know you're cold and scared and hungry and lonesome and in 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 the latter of those two that mistrust can be so severe that there's the syndrome you and I know about called failure to thrive and that baby dies. And that's how we identified that term because we witnessed it in institutional settings that were unsavory, let's say. And um, so if you grow up trusting, and I came into the world trusting into a really strong mom and dad and family structure, trusting people was just the most natural thing to do. That has not always served me well. Discernment, maybe that's why I love St. Ignatius and the Ignatian process of discernment is because I would like to reserve my judgment and be a little bit more withholding at this stage in my life, my sixth decade of life, have more wisdom about where it is I place my trust. Well, it's, it's interesting to set in the counseling room or to work with people who have uh, gone through uh, the loss of trust. Yeah, it is. Because what happens is the first thing I think it does is it creates an, a moment of pain. Mm. And pain so many times, uh, emotional pain is tied to disappointment. Mm -hmm. You know, how many times I've heard, I, I can't believe that he or she would do that. Exactly. And so that there's that moment. And if you, if you deal with the pain through working to understand the behavior, mm -hmm. then you can create a pathway to control the pain. If you can, if you cannot control the pain, then it turns to hurt. Mm -hmm. And hurt to me is just a very, is a deeper level of pain. It's a, it's a internal scar mm -hmm. uh, that you can't stop looking at. And, and then what happens is when you get to that place, then that can make you very skeptical. I mean, how many people have you known that like in a relationship had the pain, uh, they didn't face it or deal with it. It turned to hurt which created a permanent scar, mm -hmm. which then didn't allow them to get beyond it because hurt can cause projection of what could happen. And yeah. there's so many people who live in life with a projection, you know, I don't want to get in another relationship because I don't want to get hurt again. Exactly. Beautifully stated. Yes. Yes, if people don't have recovery, you know what, that that's, you just, boy, this is a, boy, this is a good show. <laughs> you just helped me on a topic that I've suffered over for decades, literally. Forgiveness, in my mind, it's not, it, you know, I feel like with forgiveness, then you sort of owe the person, as opposed to the way that you set it up, that, that they have to earn their way back into it. But what it really is, is it's, um, it's a reconciliation for your own self. Forgiveness of others is a reconciliation for your own self. You reconcile with what it is that took place. And then you, you, know, you, can, you can establish or reestablish your boundaries from that point. But there are people who cannot, they can never rectify in their own mind, in their it, through their own pain, if that scab starts to heal, that wound starts to heal, they're convinced that somebody else picked it off. You know, why did you come in here and hurt me like that again? I didn't. You did it all to yourself. Well, and and one to me, and this is just me, okay? Yeah. But one of the ways you, for me, you keep pain from turning to hurt is that you got you have to find your place in the situation because it's never just one person right 
It's two people. Right. And so many times it's the result of the clashing of personalities. Mm. And that, you know, I, I, I say this all the time. You and I have a minimum of four personal, different personalities. Yeah. Everyone I know is schizophrenic. Oh, they're not. Yeah, they can. I mean, don't you go through personality changes during the day? Okay, so there's mood changes, personality. I know you and I are funny on this topic. This is hilarious. Um, it's not a personality change. It's the depth and the breadth of a personality. And so you have different moods. Um, but someone, if they, you know, if someone, if someone offends me, um, I might, I might get really crabby about it, but that doesn't mean it's a different personality. It's just another one of my many traits. But the different traits are your different personalities. It's you're slipping, you're slipping into another part of who you are. Yeah. And to mo to me, a mood is just, you know, I think you have one personality that's, that's constant. I mean, it's who you are at your core. Yeah. Right. And on any given day of your life, that's, that's who you get up as. Yeah. Ah, but there are certain days that you get up and what's the phrase on the wrong side of the bed. <laughs> okay. And so, and you know, I get used to you based upon your consistent personality, the right. thing you are the most. Right. And yeah. then all of a sudden one day you get up on the wrong side of the bed and you come out and you, you call it moody or you're crabby or you're, you know, you're just not who you've been. And I go, I wonder what's wrong with her. <laughs> and I get to understand you based on your predominant personality. Yeah. The confusion you bring to my life is when you slip into one of these other, and we'll use your word, moods. <laughs> and I don't know who you are. This sounds like a very male versus female perception in this conversation. This is hilarious. Um, you don't think you go through different moods? Yeah, but you're calling it different personalities. And I'm saying the personality is pretty substantial and core and grounded. And then the things that you know, if somebody's schizophrenic, they literally don't know where their hand ends and the wall begins. You know, they're psychotic. They they don't have a sense of reality. I, I on the other hand, <laughs> always have a sense of reality to the point where it's annoying sometimes. Don't. I don't? None of us do. We have places where we don't have the sense of, of reality. And, and that's why we tend to react to a situation. If I had the sense of that reality then I would take a deep breath and I would handle it there and I wouldn't become reaction. I mean, I think you go through a minimum of four personality changes a day. I think a phone call, and let's use your words, uh, I think a phone call can change your mood. Um, I, I think an email can change your mood. <laughs> And when your mood changes, so does how you internally look at a situation. I'm keeping Google up here for us today. We're going to move from forgive over to um, personality. Although we really ought to, we ought to really pull out our um, our psych libraries. Okay, so personality: the combination of characteristics or qualities that form an individual's distinctive character. Yeah. And you don't think that's not more than one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, brother. So what were we talking about? <laughs> well, but this all plays into trust. Yeah. Which part of you is it that I trust? I trust the person that I am the most confident with. Who is the personality I'm the most confident with? The one that you, in your state of being normally abnormal, are most of the time. <laughs> it's so funny the way that you put that. So, yes. Okay. So the thing, and we I think we've talked about this before. The thing that the most undesirable characteristic in a human being is their volatility. 
Like when we walk into one another, when we walk in the room with one another, we want to know when we greet one another, who we're greeting. And if you're volatile in your world, you've got the person has got too many personalities flying in. And I'm saying, you know, your characteristics are too dramatic and unpredictable. Like if I, if I know you as a kind and loving person, but the, you know, the hair on the back of my neck goes up because I've evoked in you something that has set you on fire in a negative way. That's just creepy. I don't want, I don't want anything to do with that. But you've, you've, you've done this. I mean, how, have you ever met a person and you said, I like them as a person, but I don't want to be around their personality? No. You've never done that? No. What I say is, you know, that person is, is uh, interesting, but, you know, they're kind of icky. Well, the person is what you see. The personality is what you experience. So there have been times when I've seen a photograph of somebody and then met them and thought, ew. <laughs> you know, you look like a nice person on a, on a flat screen, but in real life, your, your personality is horrible. I know it. <laughs> but I, I'm comfortable with living with me. And, you know, that's, and how many times have you heard this? Uh, it's okay if you don't like me. I like me. And if you don't like me, you don't have to be in my life. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. I mean, what is it that makes you trust a person? Their stability. That here's the core of what we're talking about. You know, you can have, you can have, we all have got, because of our mind and our heart and our gut, we experience different thoughts, which trigger different neurotransmitters and, and, and cause our heart to um, communicate with our mind and send signals and cause us to think and feel differently. And you roll your intuition and your wisdom into that and all of that comes together. But the, but the bottom line is that it is the stability of somebody that I really appreciate, you know? So like with, with, with people who I do business with or that I'm friends with, I was thinking about that this morning. There was there was somebody that I knew was in distress and, and it's a friend and I, and I, I was concerned about them. And so I reached out to them, but I reached out to them in a very uh, passive way, just through a text message, because I didn't know if I would be greeted with somebody who would not greet me, just ignore me, or who would think, well, but like, why are you checking up on me? because I was concerned, you know, you never, I don't really know if I'm going to meet with the person who's been warm and responsive or if, if, you know, whatever, but it's that instability that I don't like. So I was thinking about that this morning, interestingly enough, it was probably an anticipation of our show today, but when, when I don't know if some, if, if I don't know what I'm going to be greeted with each time I encounter somebody, that speaks to me of their instability inside of their core character. It's not about them having dis different personalities. It's about the, inst I know I'm going to argue the point with you. It's their, it's the instability of who they are. Like every time you and I meet, I know that I'm going to meet with someone who I care about, who I respect, who is, is loving and generous and conversant. And you and I have had, you know, rubs with each other where it's like, Hey, what are you doing over there? But it wasn't because we had different personalities coming out. It was because we were looking at something topically and emotionally and expressing it and not understanding one another fully. So how do you find how do you define stability? Don't Google it. How do you define <laughs> it? Leave Google alone for definitions. How do you define stability? Stability is constant, it's persistent. It, it, stability is like the ground underneath your feet. You know, I don't like being in earthquakes. I've gone through a few. I don't like it because the ground underneath me, I want it stable. I want it reliable. So if it's shaking unpredictably, it's not stable. And then everything is at risk of falling in and falling down 
and crumbling around me. So stability to me is consistent. It's consistency. I define stability as consistency of behavior. Consistency of behavior. Okay. All right. Because when you're consistent in your behavior, yeah. I know who you are. Yes. And what what will rock my world is all of a sudden then that when that consistency of behavior all of a sudden becomes an inconsistency that I haven't seen. Mm. So when it rocks my world, one of the things it rocks is whether I can trust you or not. Right. And the, the lack of stability, the instability plays with the word trust. Yes, it does. That's right. Yeah. Because, you know, and I, I heard this so many times in the counseling room. This is not their normal behavior. This is, this, and I heard this, this is not the person I married. Or this is, this is not the person that I've known. And is it possible that what I want is I all, you know, if I'm insecure and unstable within myself, do I always want you to be that same person that I've known? And I don't want you to be different. So if you get different, if you become different and growth creates difference. Yes, right up. Okay, so if I start to grow and all of a sudden it's not the person you're used to, can that affect my relationship with you? And in that relationship, does it affect whether I feel I can trust you now or not? <clears throat> Yeah, right. I get that. I absolutely do get that. I will tell you something. Well, it's about time. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm not being stable with you because I'm always getting what you're saying. And now today it's not so much. You know, I've actually never had the experience. I can say this honestly. When we are really honest with ourselves, the issue of trust always comes back to ourself because and you and I touched on this earlier today the issue of trust when we say this isn't who I married hang on a second here folks there were things you didn't want to see but you know everything Freud was really very accurate Sigmund Freud was very accurate when he wrote we leak everything about us is here to be viewed it's just it, it, whether it is viewable or not depends on the people who are looking so when people like with you know with our training richard people will sometimes say ah oh, i feel so vulnerable with you now you can see everything well everybody can see everything but we happen to be people who want to see and it's not for nefarious reasons it's for loving and compassionate reasons to try to really understand so the times when I have been in a relationship, a business relationship, a friendship, or a romance, and it didn't, it didn't work out, if I caught myself saying, oh, I had no idea, this is so unfair, I was full of cock doodle do Because you know what really the truth was, and I think I've had, I've had to admit this to myself, I saw it, and I didn't want to believe it. Because I wanted to believe that I was wrong and it was going to be different and I was going to be an influence or whatever, whatever, whatever. Ha. Can I take what you're saying and put it in one statement? Please. Okay. <laughs> yes. Trust is when you are the person I need you to be. And how many times do situations lack stability when all of a sudden I have this picture of you of what I need for you to be mm -hmm. and you have been that person and then all of a sudden uh, you go through your own earthquake mm -hmm. and you start stepping over, over to find a different part of your life now all of a sudden you're not that person that I've, I've, I've been used to having in my life so trust is when you are the person I need you to be. Okay, now hang on a second there, my friend. 
I'm hanging on. <clears throat> and that's an aspect of trust. That's not all of trust, but that's an aspect of trust. Well, nice recovery. <laughs> because my question to you and what I said, hang on now, because if trust is when you are the person I need you to be, well, what's my end of this in terms of what I need? I mean, why, why is trust based on what I need you to be? How about if it's trust is based on my judgment of who I think you are? But it, it, always, it always starts with you. Oh, everything does. Yeah. Well, but in most people's lives, yeah. most definitions of life are based upon their needs being satisfied. And, and if I'm used to you being one personality okay. or, or a consistent personality, yeah. and all of a sudden you shift, then you know what? There is a fear that comes into that. And that's the fear of abandonment. I'm going to lose you because you're not the person that, that I, I need you to be. You're not the person that I've known you to be. What's wrong with you? What, what's going on here? Yeah. yeah. And then you don't want to hear that I'm outgrowing you. Yeah, right. Yeah. Because need is based in the stability of sameness. Well, I'll tell you what, I've got relationships and situations just zooming around in my mind. <laughs> That's so right. That is so right. Uh-oh. Wow. You know, and, and again, this is a, a controversial statement, but I believe that most people seek others to fit into their life who yeah. give them permission to stay where they are. We seek others to be in our life. Who so give us permission to stay where stay we are. Where we are. Um, actually, I'm going to challenge you a little bit on that one. Go because, ahead. Because <laughs> go right ahead. That's what you always do. Um, I actually, I, I'm in, I'm in, I'm kind of in that point in my life right now where, um, I. In the dating world, uh, it seems like at this point in our lives, people want you to have your residence, have your life, have everything be predictable. And I'm going be to be stable. They want you to be stable. Yeah, but yes, but you can be stable, but on an adventure and saying, look, you know, this is really a terrific adventure. And it would really be, I would like to have a mate take the adventure with me. And I'm running into I'm running into potential mates who are saying, "You want to do what? Wait, why? Why would you want to do that?" And then people want to talk about retirement, you know, like retire and and like, okay, retire to do what? To sit there to what do you do and what do people do in retirement? Well, first of all, I don't like the word retirement because retirement says I'm ready to die. I think oh. retirement means you're going to go to bed. The problem is, you, you. what does it mean? I'm going to retire for the night. I'm not, yeah, I'm not going to die. Well, to me, uh, when a person from job or profession retires, to me, what it says, I'm finding another pathway for my life. And this is a challenge for a lot of people, especially men, because th during their life, all they've known is their <laughs> career and they don't have anything else. Their, their work has filled their life between work and family. That's all their life is. And they don't find other avenues. So when that's taken away from them, that routine, they don't know what to do. We used to, we found this in on the when I was on the church staff that we had a 17-story retirement center. And when people would come there, uh, before you could move in, you had to you had to have a session with me. And my purpose was to find out what's your future look like. And what? It, it was amazing how many times I'd visit with a couple and the, the gentleman had worked for 25, 30, 40 years, at the, you know, doing the same thing. And when they would leave, I'd put a little note in the file about how long I thought he would live. Whoa. 
And most of the time I was right within six to eight months. Say more about that because that, that is absolutely fascinating. That's important. Well, it is because most people don't plan for the future. Okay. Yeah. They look at the future. And then when, when the day comes that what has been their normal life and they've trusted their self in that normal life because that's who they are. It's, it's amazing how many men, if you ask them, who are you, they'll define their self by their job. And it used to be because it's changing today. If you ask a female to define herself, she would define herself through her family. But today, many times with the amount of the number of women that are in the working world, they also define their self through their job. Mm -hmm. And when you only have one definition for who you are, that's dangerous. You know, <clears throat> that's so interesting because as a, as a lifelong entrepreneur, I've always uh, resisted when people say, oh, you know, that's business and this is personal. My personal and my business life have been so intertwined. And I think that is because my, my, my life purpose is what my business is all about. And my personal life just is. <laughs> You're fixing to get yourself in a corner here. Be careful. I think I am in a corner here. <laughs> I think I just realized why I'm single. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Well, you know my four rooms. I think you live in four rooms in your life, business, family, social, and personal. Yeah. And the most important room in your life is your personal room. Yes. Because your personal room is your, your room of discovery. Yeah, right. It's that room where you can go and put a do not disturb sign on the door. Yeah. And people honor it. And the challenge is so many times we get our business and our family room overwhelming our personal room. And personal room is where you go to learn about yourself. And what I learn about me, then is what I take out into the other rooms of my life. And you don't have to be around a person very long to understand whether they have a personal room or not. Most people, their personal room scares the hell out of them because in a personal room, you got to be flat out honest with yourself. Oh yeah. And you know, I, I've had people tell me, I don't want to go there. You're right. <laughs> yeah. I boarded up that doorway. <clears throat> yeah. It's, it's my, my little thought. Most people want honesty as long as it's not honest. And I think the hardest person in the world to be honest with is yourself. Of course. Absolutely. And you know, it's interesting because when, when we, um, wow, I have so much running through my mind, you know, look at the people who are kind of in our industry of being, uh, in, in, uh, well-being, you know, mental health, uh, either doctors of psychology or counseling, uh, speakers and authors. We aim to have our personal life reflect what it is we're out here talking about. We, we aim to live into what it is that we believe in and have it infiltrate our personal lives to enrich them. And do you, so- Do you protect your personal time? Do I protect my personal time? Yeah, I do. I have not always protected it as well as I needed to. Um, and a lot of times my personal time was not, I'd say for the majority of my life, my personal time has not been personal for me very much. It's been in a caregiving role. And so my, a lot, the majority of my life was spent attending to the care of, um, like my, my parents, for one thing, uh, an ill spouse at another point in time. Uh, but, you know, through, through those experiences, which by the way, not a single complaint, not one breath, 
because in that caregiving role, you learn so much about yourself and about the dynamic between people. And also, if you allow it, you really learn a lot about how you want to age. And 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 uh, um, shift your trajectory with awareness. And one of the things that that I I really incorporated into my life uh, was self care. And what do I do for my self care? Who helps take care of me? Because I can't do it all by myself. I need to bring others into it. Because um, you know whether it's a massage or you know some sort of a, a spa treatment or or a, you know meditation or something um, you cannot do everything for yourself in terms of self care but solo time yeah absolutely I I'm I'm very protective of my solo time um, do you think that in your personal room alone with you with a do not disturb sign on the door. Yeah. Do you think that in that personal part of your life, that's a place where you learn what you trust or don't trust about yourself? It's one of the places where I learned that. It's, it's a place where I can have um, my mirror of self-reflection um, at its strongest point if I allow it. But then there are, there are, quite frankly, there are other times when I really learn the most about myself in the face of another. You know, like as playful as you and I are being today um, and, and doing a live broadcast, you know, which, which goes all over the world, it is still personal for me and you as we're, as we're talking about things. You know, I've had a couple of epiphanies in here. <laughs> You know, and we're keeping it playful and fun. And it, you know, self-awareness in that personal room and 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 self-reflection doesn't have to bring you to tears. It's not about being miserable. Some of it is absolutely delightful. Some of it is just like wow. And some of it is really painful. Well, you know, and again, this is me talking, not you. Okay. Um, I'm glad but, you know the difference. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, believe me, I do. Um, but you know, here's what I do. Yeah. In my personal room, I discover. And then what I've discovered about me. Yeah. I take out of that personal room and I test it in the rest of my life. That's true. That I like it that you said that. I like yeah. that a lot. Because the, the important thing is to understand in most people's lives, there's too much noise. Yeah, there is. And we don't know how to quiet the noise because we don't know how to say no. Yeah. And most of us do not know how to hang a do not disturb sign on our life. So what do we do? We tell people, leave me alone. And then we say, okay, come on in. Mm -hmm. And people don't understand the importance of having that alone time. Because in my personal room, you know, I build, I build a lot of trust in myself. I build a lot of trust in my thoughts. Mm -hmm. I build a lot of trust in what I, I believe about me and what I want to take out to other people. You know, this is one of the things, Devin, we're going in so many different directions. This is where trust. But I can listen to someone stand on a stage and speak and know real quickly whether they really trust what they're saying or is it just words coming out of their mouth to manipulate an audience? Absolutely. Yeah, me too. You see, and here's another aspect. I think trust that I believe in about me is what creates my passion. Oh, yeah, absolutely, 100%. And you know, something interesting that, that sparked in my mind while, while you were speaking is um, I have always set up my homes so that there was a distance between where you would have to land, you know, like park your car or if you were out on a walk before you could have access to me. So um, my home, when I, was, when I was looking to buy this home uh, 30 years ago, very quiet street, wide street, private street, park your car, 
it would take you from the time that you would pull up, turn turn around, you know, one way street, turn around, park in front of the house. Um, it would take you about 12 minutes before you would arrive at my door. I like that. And, and if you just pulled up and it was a surprise, I, I would be able to see you. And, and, and I wasn't seen. The house was far enough back from where the car was parked. I would see somebody pull up. It was quiet. And I would see someone pull up. And even if I didn't, if they rang my bell, I was protected on the inside of my house. I never had to answer that bell if I didn't want to. No one would know. My car, my automobile was in a garage behind the house and there was a, a driveway gate that was private. You couldn't see into the yard. And I like that. I like my privacy and my incubation and my isolation. I cherish that. I like being able to be able to walk around my garden. I, I purposely bought a house without an alley in, in between me and my neighbor in the on the street behind me. It was just yard to yard and it was a shared fence. So you knew who was on the other side of that. No entry into the yard other than that driveway gate. And so I could go back there. That was my personal room. And I spent a lot of time outside all year round in that space. And I, and I love that. And I do that where I am now too. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a protocol to get in the building. You have to go through a doorman. You have to sign in. They have to call me. Nobody has permission to come through their entry to where I'm at. And, and I like that. I like that. I like that private space. I like not having, you know, an open door. Like somebody can just walk up, knock on the door and, you know, hi. Well, see, here's one of the things about me that I've learned. Okay. I am basically an introvert who has learned because of what I do <clears throat> to be okay with being an extrovert in front of people. But my basic nature is to be an introvert. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this comes from, I know it comes from my childhood yeah. where I protect myself from people. Yeah, you do. And when I, when I screw up my life, is when I open the door to the wrong people. Yeah. And we all do that. Yeah. I want to make sure we uh, that I can share this with um, our audience. That uh, I sat down this morning after uh, I had we had our early morning conversation where I was up and busy and you were still laying in bed. Uh, and my mind was already working. And then when we talked and we decided the direction of the show today, yeah. I sat there at breakfast and I wrote two things down. Number one, from my experience with people. Yeah. What do I hear that are the most common things that I've heard about breaking trust? Uh -huh. And here's what I've heard over the years. Okay. Uh, the breaking of a moral commitment. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, re repeating behaviors that you said you wouldn't, mm -hmm. excuses for what you do, uh, a feeling of being lied to. Yeah, horrible. Yeah, and then <clears throat> keeping you in the dark. Yeah. And so, and then this is what I wrote down as to what builds trust. Builds trust. Truth is always the platform. Yeah. I respect you as a person and let you be that person. And that I am unwavering in my commitment. You'll never doubt my commitment. And then stating and delivering what I promise I'll do. And then being willing to talk all things through. Yeah. No darkness, just light. I love that. I think you're spot on. I just finished writing a new program. I'm going to record probably... In a couple of weeks, uh, entitled "Turning Your Internal Light On." Oh, I love that! And how do we learn to live from the inside out? Which I think living from the inside out is one of the greatest fears. If you're not comfortable with you, 
that you go through. But if you're living from the outside in, you're living in darkness mm. where everybody's walking around your life with the flashlight telling you where to go. Not only that, but how trustable is it to be guided by everybody else, all the outside forces? The only thing that we have control over is our mind. And so in my mind, I need to know what my path is. I create it and I follow that path. Okay. Question for you. Yes. Okay. Yes. Take a deep breath. In your life, because of your past experiences yes. in certain parts of your life, because we vary in certain parts. Yes. Is there any part, any part of your life where you are more skeptical than you are trusting? <laughs> oh boy. Do you know, to ask that question to a committed optimist is such a challenge. Um, yeah, I think that I think I think that I don't know if I would say that it outweighs consistently, but 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 I'm holding my hands here for those just listening and not viewing our video because <clears throat> our show here is also over on YouTube where you can watch the video recording of it. But there's a balance between trusting and skepticism. So I think in all situations, I I I um I'm, I'm naturally trusting. However, <laughs> love I, the <laughs> adjectives and the conjunctions. I have a healthy skepticism. And so I refuse to be pessimistic. I do. I just refuse to be pessimistic because it doesn't serve you because, you know, the saying really uh, energy where, where your energy goes everything flows. So why not be optimistic? You know, don't be an idiot about trusting blindly, but you know, um, be careful. Sometimes, sometimes you and I need to have a conversation about blind trust. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because blind trust is dangerous. Oh yeah. Yeah. I don't want to have blind trust. Maybe that's our next week's episode. I think we got to continue this subject on trust because um, there's so much to it. Hey, uh, there's two things I want to remind people of this week. Please do. And that's uh, Friday is yep. our question and answer time. And our topic this week is uh, what has January meant to your life? What have you learned from January? I love it when we can put people in a position where they have to review and look at what they learned. And then the second thing is on Saturday, uh, is our second in our virtual seminar series on having the greatest year of your life. And That's I was right. sitting this morning reviewing everything, and I'm excited about this because it ties into our last one we did on goal setting and that I think most people set their life up for disappointment. Mm. And so what I'm going to do is we're going to in-depthly look at three ways of okay. determination and discipline. And then I'm going to give four steps that will guarantee that you have the greatest year of your life. And then February 20th, which is also a Saturday, our next virtual seminary, seminary, <laughs> our next virtual <laughs> seminar is on developing, developing consistency, consistency in your life. So friends, go to Richard at richardflint.com and ask him whatever questions. Go to richardflint.com and you can look and see everything that's there. And on that, I got to close this out before we get cut off. This is your host and co-host, Dr. Deb Carlin and Richard Flint signing out saying peace always. And we'll see you in a week. Hang with me here. Thank you for using Blog Talk Radio.